kid! Yeah? Are you looking for something exciting to read while you enjoy some sugary cereal? Yeah! Then grab a copy of Mighty Mascots from Alterna Comics! Born from the ashes of a disastrous 3D printing accident, eight living advertisements have banded together to right the wrongs of this world. Led by a former child star, these unlikely heroes are freaks to some, but you will know them as... The Mighty Mascots. The miniseries is three issues full color and printed on glorious newsprint. This is the fun superhero series that you didn't know you needed. Created and written by Keith Gleason, featuring artwork by Ian Morianto and colors by Anton Bondi. Ahoy, I can't wait for more! Mighty Mascots is part of your complete breakfast and comic book reading experience. Only from Alterna Comics. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Indie Comics Relay. I'm your host, Keith Gleason, creator of the Mighty Mascots. With me, as always, Johnny C., creator of Surrounded by Death and Sartana. What's up, buddy? How's it going? <laughs> What's going on, man? Not much, not much. It's been a couple weeks, but, you know, we're refreshed. We're ready to go. Anything crazy happening out there? Or Lots of crazy things are happening out there. The world <laughs> is a crazy place, but you know, it's great that we can take solace in our indie comic creator communities, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I've been looking forward to this episode for a while. Um, uh, Tony, uh, who's our guest tonight, is like, so when we started, you, so everyone out there that might not know, we, we started doing like a, a webisode series way back in like 2005 called Hero Envy. And, you know, we had never done, you know, set up at cons or anything before, so the first show we decided to go to, we just had like this one DVD and nothing else, basically. So the first show we decided to go to was uh, Wizard World Philly. Okay. This was what, 2008, you know, and Comic-Cons were still, they weren't kind of there yet. Like they, um, you know, they didn't become hip until I think about 2012, you know? Um, yeah. And that's when they kind of blew up, but you know, it was getting popular, but it was cool to be there. And at, this guy Tony D was the first one of the first guy creators we met at that show, and um, he's just been kind of you know friends with them ever since. And he actually even wrote an episode of Hero Envy for us, which was actually really cool, very and, cool. Uh, and uh, you know, I haven't seen him in a long time, so it's kind of cool to just kind of catch up with him and this and that, you know. So, yeah, for sure, uh, yeah, definitely. I'll be curious to, to dive into his work and uh, you know, find out a little bit more about him as a creator. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And if you're ever in Wizard World Philly, you know, in that area, Tony's usually always at those shows. So um, before we get into that, though, I always want to check. I want to let you guys know that the Mighty Mascots pre-launch page is up, Johnny, for issue 789. I'm still on. I'm still it's on live yet, but it's up. It's up. And it's it's. I'm on course for July release. I still haven't decided if I want to go with early July or late July, it might end up being late July with plastic city coming up, but we'll see. But, um, you know, sign up, you get an exclusive sticker on the day of launch. Um, are you going to go 30 days with a campaign Keith? I'm planning on 30, but you know, the, the cool thing about Indiegogo is if I want like at the end of the 30 days, you know, as long as there's like a couple hours left, you can go into the campaign and, and uh, change it to another 30 days. So if I wanted to, I could go 60 days. So strategically, I launched the Surrounded by Death campaign mid-month. Okay. So, I, you know, I would be in the middle of July. Yeah. I was in the middle of July. I ended in the middle of August. Okay. The thought process there was that if you get paid bi-weekly, you would get paid the weekend it launched so you could back it. And then when you were oh, in, I didn't even you know, think about that. And yeah. then when, and when it ends, it ends at a point at the same point, two weeks into the month, where if you get paid bi-weekly, which most people do, it you know it's it's there again too, right? And yeah, it's that's also not a bad idea. Month. It's also mid-month, so you know you don't have those end of the month expenses, rent. You know what I mean? Those things are you know they're they're not really at the forefront at the moment. You know, so in the middle of the month. People are more apt to spend money. There you go, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Era says uh, he can't wait to see us at Plastic City, one of his favorite cons. Yeah. yeah. Can't, wait too. can't wait to see you too, buddy. Um, 
Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no, I didn't even think about that, Johnny. That's a great point. Um, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll have to think about that. It's, I'm not like, um, uh, my goal is only 5,000, but I'm hoping to just hit that and then I can go into in demand and just leave it open until I'm ready to like fulfill, you know? So just right, right, getting money, but we'll see, you know, we'll see. Um, if it ends up being too much of Plastic City, I may go after the 16th. If not, I'll try to launch it before. We'll see. We'll you see how I'm pressed for time. Too, so in fairness, you'd want to juggle accordingly, right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, yeah, so we'll see. So check that out. Also, since we're on the subject, Plastic City Comic Con, July 16th, uh, for you guys out there in the Massachusetts, New England area, uh, it's the convention that I throw up in Fitchburg, Mass., um, $10 admission. Um, we got 150 vendors. It's like an old school 90s show. So, and it's very comic focused. So if you're into that, definitely come, come check us out. Kids 12 and under are free and free parking. So I can attest that. it's a great show. Yeah. You know, we don't have much else in the way of programming or anything like that, but you just come in, you, you buy from some great vendors, great creators, great indie comics. We'll have a lot of retailers there too. A lot of fun it's, stuff. Cosplay. It's literally a good old fashioned Comic Con. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You can't, and at the low, probably the lowest price in New England, except for a few of the Joe Souza shows, right? I think maybe. At this uh, point, maybe probably, on par. Maybe on par, if not less. Yeah, definitely. So ten bucks a day. Just come down there. So check that out. But all right, so we got all the plugs out of the way. Um, oh, one more big plug. Yeah, go ahead. Our good friend Jay Moores, who launched his board game on Kickstarter. Oh, so check yes. out Fay F A E. Jay was uh, the very first guest on Indie Comics Relay. Uh, yes. We want you guys to go check out his campaign. I already backed it. I went hot wild on it. Uh, can't wait to get my rewards. Nice. And uh, speaking of Jay Moores, he's going to be on, and uh, he's going to be on before the campaign ends. We we nailed the date, so he's going to come on with another guest that we have that week we'll and also yeah doing a double up and then also uh mentioning Faye, he's going to be doing a demo of it at plastic city i'm trying to set up an area where he can have his booth and then also an area where he can have the demo so if you guys want to nice. check out that game it'll be at plasticcity.com so, or plastic city comic con not, yeah. not the website <laughs> but the actual <laughs> con um but all right great well we got all the plugs out of the way. Anything you want to say, Johnny, before we bring in tonight's guest? No, let the good times roll. Okay. Let's all make right. it happen. All right. So without further ado, tonight's guest, uh, Tony D. And he is drinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. I love a good spit take. <laughs> <laughs> a spit take would have been good. Hey, Tony, what's going on? Hey, thanks Great. for having me on the show, guys. Great to be Thank here. Yeah, thank great you for to coming on. You, it's been a lot. Like I don't know if you heard in the in the green room I was talking. Like you were really uh, back in like 2008, one of the first uh, creators that you know me and Samino had met doing you know doing comic cons and like you know we've been friends ever since. And it was like you you made an impact on us. You know, way back. Oh, that's that's nice to hear. Yeah, it, I remember those days. That was that was my uh, uh, peak comic days when I was uh, working at Silent Devil. And yes. at Kenzer and Company, and I was about a year or two away from starting at the uh, the Simpsons. So, yeah, that's oh, right. Wow. Yeah, I know you had a couple like uh, you did. You did a lot of stories for them, didn't you? The Simpsons. I did about sixty stories over the years, yeah, mostly say, for Bart Bart Simpson, but yeah. some of the other ones too. Yeah, it's very cool. Now, before we get into like the comic work, like I want to take a step back. Like the first question we usually often ask our guests. Uh, first time uh, guest is was there something in your past like a comic book or or a tv show or a movie that um, put you on the path to wanting to be a comic creator or writer is there something you could point to uh my first comic was a neil adams uh batman comic awesome. uh, from the 70s it was um uh an issue where batman infiltrates the secret society where they're pantomiming everything. It's like a high society dinner, but there's no food and there's no music. It's just these high society people pretending to eat and drink and dance. Oh, weird. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And it was really well done because I remember looking at it and going, 
oh, it's weird. They're pantomiming. And I could see that in the picture. That's like, you know, how tight Neil Adams used to draw. Yeah, I know. Rest in peace, Neil. Yeah. Yep. He was a really nice guy, too. I, I met was. him a couple of times. Um, so, yeah, that got, that got me into reading them. And um, I never really understood the how they sold them because he used to buy at this newsstand where they'd rip off the top of the cover. Yes. yes. And I and I was like, what the hell, man? I wish I could get a comic with a full cover. I mean, they're cheap, but I keep getting these ripped covers. And then years later, they told me, oh, yeah, that's them returning the comic and getting their money back. Yeah. Still getting the money. And I'm just like, oh, OK. So I had all these comics for years. I had a bunch of comics with ripped covers. And I thought, how are these know collectibles? That, yeah, right. It's good to know that the dealers were shady back then too. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, the same thing. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Could have stayed consistent. Uh, the now years. that actually makes me wonder if that fed into the collectability of comics themselves. Right, you're sure. now verifying issues because they're essentially getting destroyed. Right. Sure. And then, I mean, why would you keep that one? Right. Unless you were a little kid like me, you, you would kept, you kept it just because you'd read it again. You didn't have a lot of comics right? But right. for a collector. It'd just be like, Oh, I read that story. Yeah, it's not going to be worth anything. Boom. Into the trash. Um, right. And, little and, and back then it was still a little disposable. Like there yeah. were collectors, but there weren't a lot. It was like a lot of people would just go to Seven Eleven and get them off the spinner rack. Then, treat it like a magazine, you know, you yeah. read it through a couple of times, then you toss it, right? You, yep, you'd pay for it, stick it into your fold it in half, stick it in your back pocket, and go home to read it. Yeah. You'd yep. sit on it and fall into the dirt, whatever. <laughs> well, and I mean, and we didn't like have it. media that we could just stream on our phone, right? So, right. you no, know, we miss an episode, and we've said it in shows before. A lot of people say, "Oh, well, I was really inspired by the old X Men show," and even you know, I, I, my, I myself, you know, if I missed an episode of X Men, the cartoon, I knew I can go to the comic shop, get the Adventures Edition, and it was that episode <laughs> in comic format, and it was right, to me right. it was as good as recording it, you know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, but I really got into comics like later when uh, I started doing screenwriting and uh, I'm trying to sell my scripts and it's really tough. And then somebody said to me, you know, comic books are the poor man's film medium. And that kind of stuck with me. <laughs> oh, and I said, oh, that's interesting. I could do a film, but do it as a comic. Hmm. So that's when I started to actually seriously figure out how to create them. Oh, wow. So did you have like, so was there a long gap? between when you you picked them up as kids to when you when you came back to them it was kind of like in early uh like middle school i read them then yeah. in high school i kind of started to collect them and then by the by the late 80s early 90s i was trying to figure out how to make them and gotcha. uh i tried to experiment early with scanning in the artwork and doing the word balloons and computer but it was okay. like the late 80s, so the technology wasn't there. Like the scanning, you couldn't make the lettering look like – like today you can make it look like hand-drawn. Back yeah. then you just couldn't do it. Um, then eventually the, the high-tech thing was I ordered Whizbang, the font, and okay. you used to order it by mail, and you'd get it on a floppy. Okay. And what you'd have to do is put it in your computer. You'd have to print out all the word balloons, cut them out, and then put them on the artwork, like physically put them on the artwork. Oh man! So that's like had, the, the old school way with the acetate when they used to do the acetate over the artwork, and yeah, they had this stuff you could buy. It was almost like a light decal that would it would it would create like a sticky substance for the back, but it wouldn't hurt the artwork. So you could okay. take the balloons off. I still have like a, some like of my old artwork note or something, right? Like some, yeah. something like that. Slightly stickier than that. It would be okay. a little more consistent. Yeah. Then you would have to take all that and go to Kinko's and get sort of high res copies uh, and shrink them down and yeah. then send them to the printer to be scanned properly or whatever, unless you wanted to like send all your artwork yes. through the mail, God forbid. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was the early days of me doing my first comic, which was uh, Jersey Devil, okay. which was based Remember after that. the 300 uh, year old tale. And uh, I did 12 issues of that. And we we were doing that long enough over a period of time that we eventually transitioned into the computer realm. By the end of it, I was starting to do 
oh, look, I, I don't have to do these stupid word balloons anymore. I could just type them in. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, that was daunting to me, too. I would have made comics a lot earlier than I did. But it was daunting to me to, like, actually do what you just did. Like, get all the word balloons, put them on acetate. But then also, like, trying to call, like, a print shop and try to, you know, get them to print it. Like, I like it, it's my mind back then couldn't even comprehend how you do that. Like, it just made no sense to me. Like, you know. It was just running a business. That's what it was really yeah. just you know, calling about the product and figuring out how it all worked. You just had to, had to, and today you have to do the same thing, right? You have to figure out how Indiegogo works and Kickstarter. You have to figure out how to make a video and all yeah. the things you need to do. It, it, so it was the same thing. I was just going to say, sorry, Tony, I didn't mean to interrupt. But I was just going to say, you know, I, I think back because I went to broadcasting school. And I think back to what I like to call the digital wave and that how, how that affected everything, every industry. When I was taught in a broadcasting school, I had to cut a reel to reel, which yeah. it, by today's standards is like, yeah. you know, archaic. And it's almost <laughs> the same thing. The way like you, editing when, on a flatbed, right? Like, right. Yeah. You're talking about floppy drives and printing out and actually affixing word balloons. It's, it reminds me of cutting, you know, audio tape in a in a, in a, in a sound yeah. room, you know? Yeah. I'm old enough to remember that. I did that in college. We oh, had the eight, yeah, so yeah, there you go. We had the you know? A-tracks. When I was on radio in college, we had the A-tracks. We had reel-to-reel, -reel, and we'd edit commercials together, and we'd be there with the tape, and, oh, you know, we'd God. wind it back. The chalk, the chalk um, pencil, yeah. Oh, my I God. used to video edit, and I used to have the thing where I'd, I'd have to gauge the um, – you know, the way the tape rolled, you know, it wasn't oh, right. just digital where it was like, it was yeah. like, okay, you sort of got finesse it a little bit. Like, so it goes, yeah, the, the, all right, I caught it. I caught it. I, I hit the sweet spot. We're good. All right, move yeah, on yeah. to the next <laughs> So, like, digital is just right. like, yeah, geez, right. It's, I, it's, I cut it's off half a word. Yeah, right. Mm. <laughs> so, um, so before you had done your comic, were you actually trying to break into film? Like, did you? Uh... Oh yeah. Oh no, yeah, no. And I and I still screenwrite. I'm writing for a. Um, it's a it, right now. It's a Facebook show called Roommates. It's like a sitcom, and I'm writing the comedy scripts for it. Oh, cool. And um, you know, and I've written like screenplays and stuff, but it's really tough if you're not in LA. I mean, it's tough to get oh, work. Yeah. It, it's. It's a whole thing that I could go into for hours, but bottom line, now it's a it's a lot better with the internet. But still, it's about who you know. It's the same, you know. It's the same. Well, it's old like story. the comic industry, right? Like well, there's a lot of nepotism, of yeah, all yeah. around. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. who you know, um, right place, right time, things like that. Yeah, Making for the an big, impression big on an editor, stuff. you know what I mean? It's like, you know, and just yeah. like in comics, you know, the smaller guys are great. Sometimes and then sometimes they're total scam artists and you have to be very very wary and worried. Yes. So yeah. you know, uh, I I work. I've been lucky. I've worked with a lot of great guys, even in the small uh, comics realm. But every once in a while, you find a guy. I once oh, yeah. was at a comic book show and watched two guys get into a fist fight over an action figure, which was hilarious. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> what are you guys doing, man? It's a it's an action yeah. figure. I know it's worth twenty dollars. Whatever, just yeah, right. Stop. <laughs> well, yeah, that right. and it's like, um, what's that old adage about? You know, like you. You, you're gonna die you can die from exposure you know it's like because that you know like when people are like oh why don't you come work on my book i'll give you some exposure you know oh, it's right. like, yeah you know yeah. That, that, <laughs> those are kind of like the ones you you know in the comic industry you kind of like eh. yeah i had exposure yeah. for dinner uh tonight it was great <laughs> it was absolutely free <laughs> <laughs> the people in the batman comic that tony read when he was little had exposure too you know right like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they do that. They do that in the film industry too. I mean, you'll get it. You'll get young filmmakers who will be like, "Oh, you know, this is really expensive to do. You know, I don't have money to pay you for the screenplay now, but you right, know, when right. we're making tens of get millions of dollars, on the back end, yeah, know? I'll get you on the back end. Yeah, and yeah, right, end yeah, right. Never happens. Let me yeah. say that to everybody out there: the back end never happens. Oh yeah, yeah of course. Um, well, the movie's gonna make something ridiculous, right? To even like. 
it, that's even if it gets picked up, you know, on top of that, you know, especially like, it's, you know, not to go on a tangent about the movie industry, but like, there seems to be nothing coming in the theaters that isn't a superhero movie or a remake. So it's like, you know, I mean, yeah, the entire movie industry is on its last legs right now. It is. Mostly yeah. It's because of the theaters. The theaters are falling apart. The pandemic killed them. And yeah. then they weren't in actually great shape right before because right. the movie experience sucks so badly. Uh, okay, so let me get this straight. I'm going to pay 15 bucks. You're going to show me commercials for a half hour. You're going to overcharge me for food. I'm going to be sitting in a smelly theater with a bunch of idiots who make noise. I can't go to the bathroom without missing something. Uh, why should I do this other than stream it on my computer again? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> where I'm going to have it for 48 hours and be able to watch it like 10 times or stop it and start it, get a sandwich and I want it to put up with people. I mean, love really... a Midway movie sandwich, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah. it's funny that you say that. There, should, there used to be a certain prestige in the movies. You could watch old media, old TV shows, and they, they poo-poo on people. They go, oh, this actor, he went off and did TV, and that was supposed to be like a, a bad thing. And now it's oh. like the reverse, you know? It's like a TV deal is the, what's more sought after for uh, for actors. It's kind of funny how <laughs> things have flipped in that regard. And a lot of it, like you said, had to do with the fact that the media is coming home, and it's actually a better experience at home than it can be in a theater nowadays. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ira says Tony D speaks the truth. I try. I try. Yeah. Right. Reach. Reach on. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah. So um, so were you actually? Did you have like uh, stuff in production before you started comics, or was I, it just? Um, were you see. looking for another outlet to get like like for the for instance the Jersey Devil? Was that a script for a movie or a TV show before you decided no, but to get a comic? I, I scripted it like I script everything like a screenplay. Uh, gotcha. just about even my novels are really like television shows just in written form gotcha. and um so for the jersey devil the first four issues it would be the movie and then gotcha. later i realized this is too it's too ambitious for a comic like and this is what i would recommend to young creators like don't start with a 15 mega issue storyline that's going to take you forever to do it's going to take you like five years to get it all out Start with a single issue, single story, beginning to end. Your fans will thank you. Yeah, and you can always smart. do a longer story later, you know? Yeah. And so when I got in the Jersey Devil, that was my first comic. I did the four issues. And then at the end of it, I was like, I got to do shorter stories. Then I did a two issue arc. And then finally, I was like, no, no, one issue, one issue, boom, boom, <laughs> boom. Like all the other, you know, old timey comics that everybody loves, you know? Even like Jack Kirby, Fantastic Four, which was very soap opery and led into the next issue, it was still like boom, 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 with like a yeah. little cliffhanger at the end. So yeah. What a wonderful what way to sharpen for. your skills, though, Tony, right? To do a different range of lengths of stories, you know, having to write long form for, across four issues and then, you know, two and then one. You know, I actually look back to, and I always like to point to Warren Ellis. Because a lot of his books, whether you like the guy or hate the guy, it's irrelevant. But if you look at a lot of his books, uh, We Three or Red, there were always three issue arcs, tight, awesome stories, you know. Mm. Well, he yeah, did a no, lot of one and duns too, you know. Like, and he was he was very good at that stuff, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, no, I agree with you, Tony. I think if you're just starting out the gate, you want to think smaller. You don't want to do your grand scale. Uh, 120 issue arc of you know th this fantasy thing that you know, you know what I mean like you, you just want to do one issue and kind of see if you can do it you know yes. yes that's common with the creator though I'd say is that we always want to chase our biggest idea and it takes a lot like wisdom genuinely it takes wisdom or really just an open creative heart to to understand or hear those words you know what i mean because yeah. i was the same way too out the gate i wanted to do my magnum opus yeah and i always saw it was so hard to do yeah it's hard to tell a story to get well, an artist to commit to one thing and i've had so many struggles with it in the meantime the smaller stories were actually the ones that flourished more so it just goes to show yeah, yeah and, and doing the smaller stories in some ways is is kind of harder for people who are just starting out too because it's like 
man, I got to just say everything like in this panel, you know? Yeah. And, and I made tough. that transition again when I went into web comics on the web comic factory. Then I went from one issue to how can I say three a story panels. in three panels? Yeah. And that oh, really, oh my God, that was yeah. just like a web nightmare comics for me. Tough. Yeah. yeah. I, would, I would send my early scripts on the web comic factory. The guy would, like the artist would send me like, no, I can't fit this in three panels. We'll be out of your mind. It'd be nothing but words. You got to yeah. cut this back. Yeah. And, uh, I got a lot of that myself. Yeah. The, the web comics book. are basically, you just got to think of the joke and then just try to set it up in two panels and then boom, there's your joke, you know, or whatever you're trying to say with a web comic, you know, it's tough. Uh, you know, I did comic strips for a long time, so I know too. I know that that side of it, but yeah, you're right. Um, I think it's, but it's also a learning thing, right? Like, um, like even with me, my first thing was the three issue mini series for Hero Envy. That took me five years to get all three issues done. In oh, wow. retrospect, I should have just done one like big forty issue, you know, one shot, and then see how it went from there. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you I know, it's I did it all over again. That's what I would do now with all the knowledge now that I have. You know, it's funny. I like you know. Do you rarely see the writer who can do it all in the sense of that they do consistently three panel stuff, multi issue, single issue? You know, to, and to have that type of skill set where you can apply yourself to every single version of it is just, it, it's that would be something where it's like you look at that person, you go, that's a masterful writer. They know their craft inside and out to be able to do that, you know? And that's yeah. something where you, you can look upon and go, oh, I can respect them. They, they have this skill set. It, 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 it's tough. It genuinely is hard to try to write in these different formats and also doing it consistently, you know, yeah, yeah. shifting between yeah. long form, short form writing. Well, for me, I like to eat, so I got to work. You got to work. Exactly. <laughs> that's, 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 that's what it's about. You know? so, yeah, definitely. So, so Tony, so when you started um, the Jersey Devil, what year was that? Like that you made, that you first put out the first issue. That was 92. 92, 92 the first okay. issue came out. And, and then uh, you formed Silent Devil at that same point? No, as... Silent Devil was later. That okay. was my friend's company. My company is called South Jersey Rebellion Productions. Okay. Named after the South Jersey separatist movement of the seventies where they wanted to split the state in half in the North and South Jersey. Oh, um, really? I never heard about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, and it, which was funny because it actually originally before it was a state, when it was a province of England, it was East and West Jersey. Okay. And it was mostly South in the West and East in the North kind of, it was like a diagonal line. I don't know. So oh, for some okay. reason, Interesting. but um, so uh, yeah, I did the Jersey devil and then after that, I did a uh, TV show in Philadelphia called The Comic Book Show, okay. which I was the host and producer. And we did that for a few years. And then uh, this is all in the 90s, early 90s, mid 90s. And by uh, the late uh, 90s, uh, I had moved out. I moved out to California briefly to try to do the scripts. That didn't work. Okay. I came back. And then I uh, got hooked up with Silent Devil they did Dracula versus King Arthur. And I, I remember that. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. I love yeah. those mashups. Yeah. I was the uh, marketing director of Silent Devil. That's and, right. Yeah. Okay. And that's that was my gig there. And I helped uh, Christian and his brother Adam um, do all the comics there and then uh, and promote them. And we would go to different shows. At the same time, I was still promoting Jersey Devil. I was doing a fantasy comic called The Travelers which then got picked up by Kenzer and Company, uh, oh, okay. who were known for... Um, for Knights of the Dinner Table, right? Yes. Yes. And, and then they blew and up. And they got to be like one of the longest running uh, indie books, right? Aren't they almost like 300 issues or something? Oh, they were... It's like I crazy. Think, I think they were over 300 when I was there, and that was a while Yeah, ago. like I remember they were high numbers when I worked in the comic store, and that was back in like early 2000. So yeah. I they're, can't even they're, remember. They're still around. Yeah, that's they, crazy. Yeah, they, like, they, how many, <laughs> go they ahead. Were, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. They were at their peak uh, right after I joined them. Like I joined up with them, and they were like, and then they exploded, and they they would say to me like, "Man, it's a good thing you signed on because we never would have signed you on had we blown up." And <laughs> then like saw your comic with like 
I was like, yeah, it's great to be here. And I did so many shows with those guys. It was awesome. Oh, we went awesome. all over the country. And I don't know we if I've to... ever seen them at a show. Like, Johnny, have you ever seen those guys at a show? You know, like, it's ever... tough because, you know, when you do a show, like, you only get a little bit of a time where you, you know, know what we're talking about. Have you seen you've seen that comic before, right? Nights of the Dinner Table. I've I've heard the name before. I don't know if I've I've seen the artwork. Oh, okay. I've heard the I, name in the past. I don't think they came out on the East Coast too much. They okay. primarily did Gen Con where they were superstars. It's like a gaming con, right? Yeah. Yep. That is the gaming con, or it was. Now it's eh. yeah. Uh they did Origins, another game con. Uh, they did San Diego for a few years. I was there for that. And uh, it was crazy. For a while, they were just the biggest things. They would do a reading of their comic at, at Gen Con and at oh, these wow. cons. And, and people... 500 people would show up just oh for the God. reading. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's how big they were. Well, That's I know, impressive. like, massive. Like, I've never read an issue, but I, I looked through a bunch, and I it looked like it was really deep cuts, like, really like inside stuff and i wasn't much um you know i didn't i didn't i wasn't really into rpgs all that much so it, i knew a lot of it was going over my head so that's why i never read it but i do respect that they have gone so far as indie creators and they're still going which is crazy yeah. to me you know they um they made so much money at one con i was at i think it was gen con they said tony you have to help you have to help us walk back to the hotel I'm like, why? Crap, really? And wow, said, that's we awesome. We have twenty five thousand dollars in cash, Holy and we we wow. have to all stick together. So, oh and there was Lord. so much money, we couldn't fit it in the envelope. So we took out the trash bag and the waste paper basket, and we stuffed the money in a in a trash bag <laughs> and oh walked back Lord. to the hotel. And what year was it on that? Bed what year and then was that? Counted it. It was crazy. What year was that? Around? Oh, what would you say? Gosh. That had to be ballpark. Uh, 2006, seven, somewhere in that neighborhood. Holy, maybe what a different era. Different yeah. era, but also like to see like them making that money at a convention, and also like a convention that's not really for comics. Amazing. They Amazing. were kings. It was them, and I think there was one other comic, Nodwick. I think it was called. That was about gaming, but Knights at the Dinner Table, absolute kings. And the ironic thing was, of course, that they were the kings of, in comics in terms of a financially, they were the kings of comics. Yeah. But they really wanted to do games. And <laughs> they made they, one though eventually, didn't they? Oh, they made games, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, because I they licensed wanted, uh... Dungeons and Dragons, old Dungeons and Dragons, and did their own version of it, which was in the comic. In the comic, they would refer to Dungeons and Dragons, they'd call it Hackmaster. Okay. And they did their own version of the game called Hackmaster, which I wrote. Um, I worked on the monster books. They had me rewrite cool. all 1,600 monsters in D and D, eight oh. volumes. It was oh crazy. Wow! It was a lot so of rewrite them to like be part of their thing, like yeah, it was kind of like to rewrite them to kind of be funny but kind of serious enough for the game. Gotcha. And, and they had their own specific monsters, which they had either rewritten or were part of the game, kind of, and maybe they changed the name, but. Um, there was a lot of inside jokes there if you were into RPGs. That's cool. You got to riff on it a little bit. You know, it's a little tongue in cheek. If you could be a fan of it, but also parody it a little bit, you know. Exactly. And that's also the reason that's why cool. I couldn't get into it, Johnny, because it was too, it was too inside. You know, like yeah, you know, like, too inside baseball. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So how well, long that, did that, you work? that could be an intimidating as a, as an individual on in the exterior, right? You know what I mean? Like sometimes even when something new takes off, and you're like, oh well, you know, I kind of was averted to this because I just, you know, it seemed too intimidating to take on, you know? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I would I would explain the comic as like, you know, it was like a Trailer Park Boys, right? Trailer okay. Park Boys, those guys are really into crime and smoking pot, like. Okay. Nobody else is more into that than those two things. Yeah. They're just talking. these guys. The same thing with RPGs. And so, even if you don't know RPGs, you read it and you get it. They're just absolutely like all the characters are absolutely obsessed. And gotcha. then, as you read it, you get to understand the archetypes mm -hmm. that are in RPGs. There are guys who just you know they're always out to backstab everybody. The guys who are you know the girl who plays RPGs. The 
the the guy who's just really so into his character he gets mad if he gets killed and quits the game in a huff like all those tropes are in there so i totally recommend it it's it's very very uh well done uh book um, yeah I, I i respect i always loved the name i thought the title was amazing you know um how long did you work for Kenzer and Company? Oh boy, I worked for them. I I was it. I was doing the Travelers, and then right around issue twenty of the Travelers, um, they passed me on to another publisher called Wingnut Games, and I did another five issues. I guess that was a gosh, I can't remember all these dates. I guess around two thousand ten or twelve, somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah, and uh, by then. Um, I was looking to do more Simpsons comics and I was doing, I was doing the Simpsons fairly regularly by that point. Like, how uh, did you, how did you get involved with that? Like, you know, like how did you get involved with Bongo comics, which is the company a girl, that, a that's girl Matt who was Greening's a, company, right? The guy. Yeah. That yeah. He, Simpsons he got to keep the, the, the print rights for the Simpsons. That was like part of his deal. So okay. he was able to still, he was able to print the comics and, you know, do his own cartoons too. And so it was just something he loved to do. And he made a sick ton of money because okay. some of the licensing uh, Fox kept, but just for America, but like graining got it. So like, if you go to Canada, you'll uh, at the time, I don't know if they have it now, but they would have like a Simpson store and have okay. all this other merchandise you wouldn't see in the States. So it would oh, have really? yeah, it would have t-shirts. And at the time they had this, Homer Simpson beer uh, bottle opener that would go, you know, you it would make a noise of the bottle opening in the, in the bottle opener, and then it would make it would have a line from Homer every time you opened a beer, and then, you know, just like all this other crazy merchandise that wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, sanctified in the U.S., but he could sell it overseas for some reason, oh, uh, and then the comics, which were worldwide, okay. I was told. Uh, by a, a, a fellow uh, who worked uh, in the comics industry that in Germany, uh, the Simpsons regularly sold 3 million an issue. Wow. And it was so crazy. Wow. They, would wow. buy, they would buy individual billboards just for an issue. So, really? Wow. Yeah, wow, really? It was nuts. So when the first time I got a cover, they like told me that because like at first I was like, oh yeah, I'm on the cover, cool. And they're like, no, no, you don't understand. Your story is going to be on the billboard in Germany. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, did anyone, right. did you ever, That's wild. Did you ever get a German to send you a picture of it so you could see no, it? Or? No, but I did get a friend of mine went to Germany and got one of my Bart Simpsons in German. Oh, so, that's cool. <laughs> so I got that. That's very back cool. There. So and, uh, very which, cool. Is so like was it was Bongo more like um, they pay you for the script basically? It's a work for hire mostly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Straight, and then did you just flat pay? But it was good pay. Like it was high end. Like, yeah. Like good. Like you were getting probably comparable top. to like a Marvel writer or something. Maybe. Oh, yeah. But I like, think, I think nice. we were getting paid more. I think oh, we were wow. actually paid more, at no least kidding. at the peak. They lowered it later, but it was right, but it was when pretty high. high end. Because, because, uh, was it like a like a submission thing that you did to get to become part of that, or was it um, a girl who uh, went to my high school? Who was in love with me uh got me the gig she was in love no with kidding. me back in high school and okay. she ended up marrying a guy who they say is a, is the younger version of me uh who also, <laughs> who also went to my high school which was just weird um but uh they're still married uh hi karen and uh, anyhow karen got me the job and uh you know i just started pitching and uh, they liked my stuff, so I kept working. That's you awesome. know, it was crazy to work for them because it was the only place where, you know, you'd get a note back that said CBF, and it would stand for could be funnier. And you'd be <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> man, all right, I'll so be who, funnier. Was, were, was all the scripts gone over by Matt Greening himself, or did he have people for that? Like, No, no, he had people for that. You know, okay. he had editors. I didn't know uh, how Matt, I, I don't think was. Matt was super involved in the day-to-day -day stuff. I gotcha. met him a couple of times when we were at shows. Um, he was always at – the one show Bongo would always do is the San Diego show. Okay. So yep. a couple of times I went there, and I got to meet him. and uh, Get to sign the at their booth? Did you get to sign at their booth and everything? Uh, I signed at the booth a little bit, I think. Nice. And, uh, you know, it, it was great being part of that crew. 
It was yeah, a shame like when they closed down. I couldn't believe when they closed. I'm like, why do you close a comic book company that's making money? It's crazy. Yeah, like, well, I could, you know, you know, you didn't hardly see the issues around here in the U.S. Like, I would see them from time to time, but not consistently. And like, even when I was working at the comic store, I don't think the comic store ordered any at all, which is shocking to me, you know, because yeah, Simpsons it, was still like the number one, you know, show on Fox at the time. And it was yeah. weird too, because like I, I go to shows and I always ask for Simpsons comics, trying to find my own so I could sign them or whatever. Yes, yeah, so you could have like, them, you know, for sell, selling yeah. and stuff. And uh, like, no one in the states would order them because I don't think a lot of store owners think that way. You know, they, they, they cater don't. a little bit too much to their clientele. It's very uh, tunnel vision. So it's just like, ah, it's, you know, I got to appeal to my crowd, which I understand to a certain degree. But if you want to get kids to come into your store, if you want to get like new customers, like general normies who are going to come in, you got to have something like The Simpsons. Yeah, And uh, that's why it was always selling in Germany and places like that, because places in Germany still sold comics and drugstores and places like that. The United States, obviously, that's really not a thing anymore yeah. if it uh, ever was. Maybe did, a Walmart. Uh, right, right. <laughs> and now they don't even do them there. Did, uh, did, when did Bongo like, close shop? Was it uh, About two or three years ago. I think it was right before the pandemic, I want to say. Okay. The cover wow, so that... they were making comics right up to then, huh? Uh, well, I was gonna say I, I, you know, I've been to started been going to San Diego since '09, okay. and I always recall Bongo having a really big presence on the floor, and you can almost kind of tell which comic companies had the most clout by the size of their booth, and then you'd see Bongo would always have a big booth almost right across from Marvel, so oh, it was wow. just like you know what I mean they were a really big deal. And, you know, some people overlook that. Yeah, and uh, what people probably don't know is if you go to uh, a book convention, like the Book Expo, okay. and then you see the comic book publishers in the Book Expo, it's a whole different vibe, right? I don't know if you guys ever been to the Book Expo. I haven't done the Book not. Expo. No. Yeah, I've never gone. Oh, well, first off, it, it's going to cost you about 200 bucks to get in. Oh, but, really? Yeah. Ow. Just admission? Just admission? But... It's okay. not like a comic show. Okay. And everybody's giving away stuff. Like, okay. that's the thing. They're not there so to You'll sell. walk home with, like, a bag of books, basically. Yeah, you're going to walk okay. home easily with $200 worth of stuff. Gotcha. And they're there to sell to retailers. It's a retail show. It's a true trade show. It's not a okay. fan show. Um, but you'll see the comic book publishers there, and they're nothing compared to the book publishers. Like, They've got big booths too, and they're trying. They're trying to say, "Hey, look at us too!" But like <laughs> in comparison to the book publishers, they're kind of small. Gotcha. Right. And uh, it's just interesting to note that disparity. And for Bongo, it San Diego was the only show they would ever do. It was kind of like a reward for their employees. They would take all their employees to the show and pay their way. And it was gotcha. kind of like, "Oh, this is your bonus. This is your little mini vacation." And um, so they didn't do New York or any others. They would have cleaned up had they done it. You sure, know? New York, yeah, definitely. Oh, they definitely. could have gone absolutely. To, they could have gone to Essen in Germany, and they would have absolutely killed. They would have sold every piece of merchandise they had. They would have sold the boxes the things came in. I mean, they, <laughs> people in Essen, they would have lost their damn minds if the Simpsons showed up. People don't I know imagine. that if you go to Europe, they love you. If you work on American comics, I had a friend who did the inking for uh, Donald Duck. Okay. And she said when she went to Spain to do a show, they treated her like she was royalty. They gave her a bodyguard and a hotel. Oh, and, my God. <laughs> yeah, it was it was like crazy. You know, I, Peter I, David. One of the, yeah, one of these days I'd love to do a show overseas just to see, you know, the difference between, you know, U.S. and here. Uh, that's like one of my bucket list things to do before, you know. Drink from the cup of comic royalty. Yeah, King. exactly. <laughs> I need my it's own huge. bodyguard, right? You know? Yeah. So. <laughs> it's huge. Peter it's huge. David tells the story. He was over in Spain, and he said, you know, he's just doing a show. He thinks it's a regular comic book show. He goes out to, like, on the street, I don't know, a hot dog vendor. I don't know what they have in Spain, uh, a yeah, tortilla really. vendor. I don't know. <laughs> so he goes to the vendor, and he looks over, and he sees newspapers, and he sees himself on the – on the front of the newspaper. 
and he and his eyes go wide and he's like he can't read spanish and he picks up the newspaper and he's like why am i on the newspaper <laughs> like what a, and then somebody says oh yeah you're a big celebrity oh wow peter david american comic book author of hulk and then people start like oh wow the hulk author's here and like he's just like i better go back inside because i'm gonna get mom and you know, like swung by the paparazzi yeah, swung like he's crazy. one of the beatles yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing like I, I i was i was gonna theorize that I, my guess is why bongo probably just closed shop is probably because it matt greening i mean what does he need it for i mean he's dude's like yeah. you sure know? What but, uh, did the was, Disney sale have anything to do with? Oh, it? maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I think I, that was probably it. I think you know they cut a deal. It was an all-encompassing thing. It all went to Disney, and then he was just out. And yeah, that probably. Money, I guess sense. I don't like, know. And after doing it for so time, long, too, he might just be like, yeah, whatever, you know. Yeah, I mean, he spent most of his time meeting with his lawyers, tracking down guys who were bootlegging Simpson stuff. I mean, oh, really? that was like. Yeah, that was like a huge thing. It was just huh. they they had like tons of this stuff they had to track down because in multiple countries it wasn't even, it was like worldwide pirating of Simpson stuff. Oh, I, re I do remember the bootleg Simpson shirts on the streets of Boston in the '90s. People would just go sit up and you know the the common. And uh, they'd be selling Simpson shirts, and you know, uh, Bart was a little orange instead of yellow. You know? <laughs> right. Well, I think you're <laughs> Johnny. A I think you could still go up to Hampton Beach and get a Bart Simpson pissing on a Ford logo right now. There you go. <laughs> right? Don't have a cat, dude. Yeah. yeah. Right. Wait a minute. <laughs> right? I don't remember Bart saying that. Um, <laughs> so now after after the bongo thing, is that when you kind of started doing a little more screenwriting or did you do more comics at that point? Or Well, in 2010, I launched the Web Comic Factory with my uh, friend Christian Baranak. Okay. And, uh, yep. you know, I remember because... Christian. I haven't seen him in forever. Christian is has uh, transitioned, as they say. And, uh, oh, okay. I really and, uh, haven't seen her forever. Then. Yeah. So um, Christian and I uh, started the Web Comic Factory together, and okay. we did a bunch of comics. Um, we do a different comic every day. Christian went on to uh, do her own comic. She's got a web comic called Validation, and she's doing this other comic about unicorns. And she's got she's got some stuff on um, uh, Patreon. You can check out. Cool. Um, Very cool. But uh, cool. I I kept uh, doing the web comic factory, and so we have uh, a rotating cast of seven different, mostly strips, but like some graphic novels where we just do a page page on that day. Uh, we do a fantasy comic called Pandemonium, okay, uh, which is on Thursdays. Uh, what is today? Oh, that's tomorrow. So today is a strip called I Hate My Kids. Uh, this is <laughs> it's all about how terrible kids are. <laughs> um this today uh this is my uh page for the pineys uh which i put on the web comic factory site because i only read really need a page and uh the pineys is my uh novella series uh and the premise it's it's sort of I'm, I'm going back to my roots so i'm going back to the jersey devil legend uh and is this like is the all pine about South Jersey or whatever the, like in uh new jersey right the pine barons is that mm -hmm. what it's a uh, riff on okay yep the Pineys, oh. the term the Pineys is like uh, calling somebody a hillbilly in uh, oh, South Jersey. Oh, okay. It was okay. a derogatory term for many years that the elites in Philadelphia would call people from South Jersey. Oh, those Pineys, those superstitious gotcha. Pineys. Gotcha. And then over the years, uh, the people of South Jersey sort of, we co-opted it. And now we're like, yeah, we're Pineys, ha ha. And, uh, you know, that's why there's a Piney Power t-shirt. Like, that's a big thing. Uh, down down this way. So uh, this is uh, the first book, The Pineys, uh, My Cousin, The Pineys. There's, I just launched an audio book of the first book here. Oh, cool. And uh, they're designed, they're Ooh. like the old pulp novels. They're short, punchy novels. And the premise is, for those of you who don't know, the Jersey Devil is like New Jersey's Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. Okay. And uh, he, he famously had a mother named Mother Leeds. And she was uh, in the 1730s living in South Jersey before America was a country. And she had 12 children. And then she was giving birth to her 13th child. And she said, 
let the devil take it because she was so sick of having children. And thus was born this horrible monster that ate mm-hmm. the family, flew out the chimney, and has been haunting the Pine Barrens ever since. And that's sort of the basic story, and that's what I based the Jersey Devil comic on. The okay. Pineys, the premise is uh, Mother Leeds was a witch, and she opened the portals of hell and flooded the Pine Barrens with hundreds of devils. And okay. in the neighboring village of Abe's Hat, New Jersey, the hunters banded together to create a secret hunting society to hunt down the devils and send them back to hell, and their ancestors continue to hunt to this day. And that's what the books are about. The modern oh, day like hunters in South Jersey, kind of like Ghostbusters with, with drunken hillbillies in South Jersey. And uh, <laughs> so cool. we, they that's run around cool. South Jersey hunting these devils and, and killing them in a certain way that sends them back to hell. And then they mount their heads on the secret room in the back of the lodge. That's awesome. I love the premise. And I, you have a lot of these, huh? What, what number yep. are you on? Uh, I'm on eight. book eight. Oh, book wow. nine. Book nine comes out in June. No and, kidding. That's, yep, that's awesome. I'm editing that now. And book 10 will be out in October for Halloween. So uh, book cool. nine will, will, will be uh, all about uh, the witch hunters. Okay. And uh, book two is all about the witches. And the witches are uh, part of South Jersey folklore. And then in book nine, uh, early, early in the series, one of the characters mentions witch hunters and how they haven't been seen in 100 years. And then in book nine, the, the witch hunters come back. And uh, so we get to see some of the witch hunters. So there are all these different fighting supernatural factions in South Jersey uh, besides the hunters. And uh, okay. they all exist in this world around it. So uh, cool. this, this is book five, uh, the Jersey Shore Piney. So it's a, it, it, it can, encompasses a lot of Jersey flavor south jersey flavor which is a very specific thing like going to the shore in the okay. summer is a very specific thing in south jersey that's what we do oh it's summer you write it so shore. it's accessible to anybody though right like exactly anyone can, anyone can pick exactly. it up like i see the tentacles in the background it's great that's right that's uh that all connects in so you, you, it looks got- like if you if you don't mind me saying uh, the artwork and i don't know if you did this on purpose but just looking at some of these covers, I, I I'm thinking R.L. Stein. Is that uh, a little bit? I got that, that vibe too. Like, yeah, uh, I, is that I've on gotten purpose? that. Yeah, but really, what I'm going for is the old pulp, the old pulp stuff, right? I got gotcha. you. Know? Like, uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Like Doc like Savage, yes, Shadow yeah. kind of yeah. thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't want to. It's not too kiddy. I, it's not like kids stuff, like little kid stuff. I would say it's more like in the PG-13 range. I don't gotcha. like to pigeonhole it. Most people I like say, ah, eh, there's cursing at it. I mean, get over it. Um, it's but- not like YA, but it's like, it's like, it, like, yeah, like YA, I, th- I always think is sort of very dumbed down. Where I think this is more like, um, like what they mean when they say all ages. Would that be a good Kinda, descriptor? Yeah. Again, you, you know, it's hard to. You, it's it's difficult to put that label on it because when people hear all ages, they're like, oh, it's for little kids, screw it. Um, but like this, I, one of the problems with doing independent comics and books is you're only so you're stretched so far, right? Yeah. Like you could come up with this idea that that's so broad that could work on the national level, but you don't have the means to get it to everybody. You yeah. just don't, uh, unless you get hooked up with a big company that could splatter it all over the creation. You just can't get it to everybody. With the Pineys, what I wanted to do was focus specifically on South Jersey and explore that world. Okay. And um, so when I go to different shows, I can, I can do just about any show here. I do comic shows. I do book shows. But I also do local craft shows that oh, take okay. place in South Jersey. Because yeah. when I tell them what book I do, they go, oh, you do a story about the Jersey Devil? Oh, sure. We'll have a table for you. And because uh, they're very excited about it because it's right, part of it's our... a local thing. Well, it's like, exactly. I was just going to say, I think that's something that really like, like speaks to me directly is that I, I like that it's regionalized and it offers a regionalized flair and flavor, like you said. And, uh, you know, whether I've been to the location or not, it, it almost feels like you're visiting, right? You're, you're, exactly. you're being transported. And that I really like that a lot. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah so and- Go ahead, Tony. I was going to say, and I'd advise any young creators out there to try to do the same thing. You know, they they think from, you know, if I do just a local thing about what I do and about, you know, the kind of world I live in, nobody's going to be interested. You're wrong. 
people are interested in local stuff. They like it. And people outside that world also like it too, because it's different for the very reason you said, right? You, you enter that world and you go, wow, this exists. Oh, okay. Maybe yeah. I'll go to South Jersey and see what it's like in the podcast. Right. And it, uh, if you craft good characters and people can relate to it on any, you know, any exactly. level there. So it's like, even though it's, regionalized if you have a good character it brings them right into that world and they can you know and well, if you you know in your descriptions of it will will help you know just sell the tale you know the, the world is kind of a big place and there's lore everywhere you know yep. i mean there's yep. uh in worcester we have a cemetery called spider gates and there's a lot of just myth that you know is it brought up you know over passed down by generations that's just old ghost stories or is it their truth to it or whatever the case may be. But, you know, that's everywhere. And it wouldn't exist outside of that area unless it was written about the same way you're doing for the Pines. And I think that's just very cool. Yeah, that's very yeah. cool. Is right. there any plans to um, – is it just going to stay in novel form? Are you thinking comic books? Are you all kind of done with comics? Or Well, what right now it's an exciting time to do these kind of novellas because Amazon is so great in terms of publishing them. Okay. Um, the price point is amazing. I can get the books whenever I want. Um, and, uh, you know, with comics, you have to put yourself out so far and it's, it's so much of a, a lot know, more bigger money, deal, a, hustle. a lot more money. Yeah. Whereas I can literally order like 10 books, sell them, order another 10 books and just keep going like that all day long. Um, so right now I'm, I'm, I'm all all about the books. I mean, Amazon's awesome. just until Amazon screws everybody if they decide to do that. God forbid. I love you, Jeff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, what are they taught? So I'm I'm out of the loop on that one. What are they talking about doing? No, no, they're not talking about doing anything. Oh, so okay. I just but, worry you know, because keep things, just keep they the wanna... status quo, yeah. then, right? Yeah, yeah. don't change a thing. <laughs> okay. Don't change a thing, damn it. Yeah, if they ever decide they want to press that thumb down, you know, yeah, there's nothing right? we can do. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just I'm just hoping like nobody figures out like how good a deal this is before they like show up, I don't know, to tax us or whatever. No, it's right, great right. that they provide a place, you know, for authors mm -hmm. to sell their work, you know, especially ones that are serious about it and about actually getting it into people's hands and you know, not the people that are just like, oh, I'm just writing this because it's a hobby, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean that's that's the problem with a lot of creators. They just like they make something and then they just sort of sit there like why isn't anybody buying it? Like nobody knows who you are. Like you have to get yeah, out there. You have to you talk to people. You get out there. You gotta gotta go to the shows. You gotta push it. You gotta you know. Get I was social just media. at a, I was just at the regular Philly show, the monthly show, and uh, the guy next to me, nice artist, nice guy, not knocking him at all, but he wasn't really talking to anybody. You know, like on the other hand, he was drawing too, but, and I get that, like, that's a bit of a draw when you're drawing yeah. at the table, but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta stop. Once yeah. Uh, yeah. For that's sure. Way. We talk about that often. All the, I was just going to talk about that all the time in the shows, you know, you look at a creator and they go, Oh, well, you know, I did really poorly at this convention. And then, you know, if you really look at, you know, if you were able to take a snapshot of them at the show, like you said, buried in their notepad or <laughs> yeah. buried in a whole their, series their of artwork. videos on this channel about, yeah. you know, about yeah. doing things. And I, yeah. and I would also say to artists out there, part of, part of the issue, I think, with comics is there really aren't a lot of good writers. And I think part of the problem is writers need the artists in the comic book industry. Like, we have to get you. And then we have to bend over backwards to get you to work. And we don't always have the money and whatever. Right. But it's almost never the other way around, right? Because artists can kind of do it themselves, but they kind of can't because although some artists are okay writers, they're not great writers. Like they're not focusing on that. So they don't understand the subtle nuances like they understand in their art. And right. what I would suggest them to do is maybe consider more hooking up with a writer, even if they're a studio sort of situation where it's like, well, I'm just going to hire a writer and he'll just write the story and I'll pay him. And, you know, he won't have a stake in it, but he'll, he'll get some money or whatever. Like almost never. I mean, writers have to do that for artists, but almost never the other way around. I think I had yeah. one situation like that. And I was going to say, that must be that. very rare because it usually is. the the whole project coordinator is usually always the writer or the creator of the concept or whatever you know and it's a shame because 
if an artist did that, and then he did what I used to do is I would bring the artist to conventions. I'd say, go ahead, sell your sketches or whatever. I'll buy you lunch. And they would make money all the time. Even the yeah. guys who nobody knew would make some money. It would be oh, worth yeah, it for them to come out. Yep. They, you, it would be worth it for an artist to do that for the very reason that they're doing this all day. You could have the writer there do all the talking. To do the talking and the engaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That's a, probably the best way to do it. You know, if you can do it, if the situation, if you're both from the same area or even, I mean, yeah. you can fly yeah, somebody it, out, but that's costly too, you know. But. You have to have a real good team there to work at a table together too. You know, I've seen both ends of the spectrum where creative teams have been at a table together and they clash and it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't flow yeah. right. And then I've seen it work where they're, you know, they, it works in tandem and it's, it, it's smooth, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's all about it's all about the deal, and and a lot of guys they overlook this. They say, "Oh, we'll figure out the money later." No, talk <laughs> about the money up front when there's no money. There's no money involved because then it'll be very easy to talk about it. Get it yeah. all in writing. Say this is the way it's going to be. Either I'm going to pay you outright, or we're going to split everything fifty fifty. I mean, yeah, you, know, you got to you got to think about those contracts. Yeah, definitely. You gotta yeah, do because. Yeah. Uh, artists get bored and they just stop drawing stuff and then you're screwed. Then the comic's yeah. dead. You can't get another guy or else you got to pay him. Fit. You still got to pay the old guy 50%. What are you going to pay the new guy? So, yeah, right. you know, you have to have clauses in there that make sense. Like, well, if you're going to quit, I'm going to hire a new artist or a new writer or whatever. Nothing, yeah. and, oh, I've made that or, or mistake. People out. <laughs> yeah. It's I tough. Think we all I have. Mean, it's, it's tough. I've been there. I know it's tough, but if you do it, when there's no money involved, then there's no hurt feelings. Like everybody's just like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. As opposed to like when the money starts coming in, it's like, wait a minute. I want more because <laughs> yeah. I'm doing more. I I spend all night drawing these comics and damn it, I want extra money. Yeah, right, uh, right. Because <laughs> a lot of the time they don't think it's real until it actually is real, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. Or, or the opposite where like you're not making any money and you're getting phone calls like, where's the money? And like, yeah, right. what money? I got yeah. a, a basement full of comics. You want to come over and visit them? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's like, I mean, that's all stuff that people, you know, it's like a, a learning thing, you know, like mm -hmm. we all do that early in the career. Now I just primarily do work for hire and, you know. And yeah, it's, it's better. And it is. You can always change it. I mean, if, you know, if you, if you work with a guy and he's really good, you don't want to lose him. You can always like give him. More. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree with that. Yeah. I'm almost I mean, at the point with my artists now. They've been with me like for going on nine issues. So it's like almost at that point where it's like, you know, hey, maybe we should talk about, you know, different yeah, things. George you know? Lucas, <laughs> yeah, George Lucas George Lucas could have screwed over Mark Hamill, Han, Han, you know, Harrison Ford and uh, Carrie Fisher, but he paid him extra money when the movie like exploded. When Star Wars exploded, he gave more money because he was like, oh, I'm going to take care of my people. You know? yeah. And that was people that, that were was with them when it wasn't cool and it wasn't, you know, when it well, was like this weird thing, this weird movie, you know. That was like the uh the phase one Avengers actors, right? They all took really minuscule paychecks in comparison to the payouts they got for the the final movies, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And that sure. was part of that it was like okay, everything you're gonna, Yeah, you're gonna commit to a nine movie deal. Okay, you know, the first one may you know, may not make that much, but stick with us and you'll see, you know. Oh yeah, definitely. Speaking sure. of Hollywood stuff, so what is there been other stuff that um that you've done that we might know about, you know, on the silver uh, screen? You could go to my IMDb and see the uh, <laughs> movies I've worked on, but okay. you know, I I they they are what they are, you know, they're Anything low budget. Anything dear to endeavors. you though? Is there one that we can point to that you're like, "Oh, I really have fond memories of working on this?" Uh, <laughs> that long pause says it all i think uh, <laughs> let me tell you about the pineys yeah um, <laughs> no i uh well right now i i am excited to be working on roommates i mean that's okay. the newest yeah. thing that's actually so on the IMDb. you said that's on facebook it's on okay. facebook right now it's running on facebook you can go to my facebook it, and you know find me and is it it's, free or is it it's like free? A pain yeah, no, play? it's free. Okay. It's on YouTube somewhere as well. I've been posting links to it. Okay. Um, 
you know, I've out. been doing yeah, I've been doing know. YouTube videos for a little while now, so you can come to my channel. And yeah, I'm I sure... saw that you had a pretty you have a pretty good channel. Like, you know, how many subscribers you got? You're up over a I, couple of grand, right? I just clicked up over twenty five hundred. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, I know. Cool. Congrats. Yeah, I know. I'm on. We've I'm been also on, the... on Odyssey, BitChute, and Rumble as well. Oh my god, <laughs> gotta diversify. How long have you been doing the YouTube channel? I actually started it in 2010, but I, I wouldn't update it. I would just make, I didn't really understand how it worked. So okay. once in a while I'd make a video and do something stupid and goofy. And then I'd forget about it for like six months. And then, and then I'd go back and do one again. Um, and I did really get it. And then a few years ago, I realized I have to do this. You know, yeah, I have it's to part build. Of like, well, that's the same thing with us too. Like we started this channel like two years ago. And we're we're still working on our first thousand subscribers. We just we're we just hit six fifty, I think. Oh, nice. But we're also like streaming to all these other places, but it's a grind, you know, trying to get up to the thousand. I I, I hear once you hit a thousand is when the the algorithm starts to help you. I think that's right? the promised land. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you start getting bit. money. The money yeah. starts to come in a little bit. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, it's just. And that, that's when they start looking at you. And that's when you have to be careful. If You guys yeah. probably don't have to worry. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I used to do political stuff on YouTube. And I had okay. to stop. I had to that's move all that. That's polarizing, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it wasn't so much that. It was just YouTube okay. just hates it. YouTube yeah. will censor you if you have the wrong political opinions, whatever. I'm not going to get into it. But I moved all my political stuff to Odyssey, BitChute, and Rumble. Rumble's the one gotcha. you got to be on. Rumble's okay. the next YouTube, I think. Is it really? Is yeah. it really? I'll have to check it out. I, it's, um, it's definitely, I mean, BitChute's pretty big, but yeah. Rumble is going, is tied in with Truth Social. Truth Social's blowing up. So Rumble is the, oh, is like okay. to Truth Social what YouTube is to uh, Twitter. And gotcha. uh, so you can post videos there uh, very quickly and easily. Um, so I, you know, and it's a different crowd, completely different crowd because of all the polarization, you know, you're getting a different crowd on there and you can talk more freely on those other platforms. Gotcha. I don't have to worry about talking about a certain, uh, medical procedure or a certain election or oh, a certain gotcha. whatever, you gotcha. know, like these are forbidden topics on youtube well, for and some i heard reason. like even like on on youtube but uh, some people were saying too you can't even mention the pandemic by name without no, like you know you shouldn't and, because yeah. you'll get you'll get flagged and then they'll put a little bar below saying like if you truly want this information about that thing you have to go here these people are obviously That's insane crazy. conspiracy crazy. theories yeah. Okay. Is there a um, comment community on Rumble? Like, is there, is it there are different things like on Facebook where you can go for comics, you can go for sports, you can go for? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. It's all it's all exactly the same. It's just right now it's smaller, but the engagement is bigger on those other platforms. Gotcha. So, for instance, I post all my I I do four videos a day, two on YouTube and then two on the other platforms. But I also put the YouTube ones on there too. So. I will always get better engagement on BitChute, which was the first w alternative platform I went on. You okay. know, I'll get like a hundred almost every time uh, for one of my videos on BitChute. Whereas on YouTube, sometimes I'll get a hundred, sometimes I'll even get a thousand, but some days I'll get 10. And right. it's just like... There's no rhyme or reason to it. Yeah. Like it's just, no, huh. not really. Yesterday I had a video, it went up and it was... It was weird. I don't know what was happening, but I had zero for hours. And I was just like, this is impossible. I never get zero. I yeah. always have guys who come in and watch both my videos. And I posted them yeah, relatively with 2, at the same subscribers, time. Yeah, 2,500 subscribers, at least like 10 views, right? That's weird. Yeah. So yeah. then I post on BitChute, and it's like, uh, huh. and, and same thing with Rumble and whatever. But it's it's all it's all be like, I talk about the atomization of audiences. And this okay. is part of that. All the audiences are being atomized, not just by politics, but by topics as well, by gotcha. region, by everything you can think of. So, bitch so that's why the audiences are smaller and more in different pockets, kind of. Right. What you're saying. Okay. But they engage. They yeah. engage more in these smaller pockets because they're not 
beholden to the bigger algorithm, which is more beholden to like, well, what what kind of plastic crap can we sell today on, you know, this channel or whatever? Yeah, right, right. And um, <laughs> so there's more at stake there. So they they're monitoring it and they're censoring it and they're they're manipulating it. But on these other platforms, there's not that much at stake. There is some monitoring. There is some commercials on Rumble. But it's not nearly as big. Like I do made they, uh, do they thirty cents on Rumble on those uh, on those uh, sites as well. Yeah, I'm monetized on Rumble. I made like oh, okay. thirty cents last month, I think. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, hey, you know, and YouTube, a, I make like you could play uh, Space 15. Invaders at the arcade. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no that's great um but i'll check those out because like you know like i agree with you there's like probably a missing audience there that might like our content maybe i could just re-upload our live streams to there or something possibly i was just maybe gonna have that. more time yeah <laughs> you know but yeah something to look at um but uh i uh you know one of the things i noted on your your um your uh bio that i thought was interesting too was um you also Used to used to do stand up, right? And then you also used to write jokes for certain talk shows and things like that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. did jokes for politically incorrect with Bill Maher. No so, kidding, no kidding. Yeah. Cool. I actually like Bill Maher a lot. How did how did you get something like that? How did how does that work? Uh, my buddy in college was the opening act. He he would come out and warm up the crowd. Gotcha. It, yeah, I know. Like cool. at those talk shows, they usually have a comedian come out, right, and get the audience whipped up in the shape and mm -hmm. things like that. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. His stage then, name. Like, his stage name is Danny Vermont, and okay. uh, he he is a stand up comic. So he got me that gig, and then um, yeah, I would just fax in jokes. Although it was weird because like they told us all to use the same sources, which were these little news clips in usa today it would be these little news bites okay. so we were all writing jokes about the same topics so they would sometimes get the same joke for the same topic and if they bought it they had to pay out five times but i guess they didn't care okay. so that used to happen all the time i would get jokes on and then and then uh, uh, other writers i hear oh yeah i had that joke too and it's like oh i guess we both got paid <laughs> So um, now, now politically incorrect. That was when he was on ABC, right? Is that first he was on Comedy Central? So that's I was what on it was. Yeah. the Comedy Central show, and then they moved to ABC, and then they used all union guys, and I was out. But gotcha. Um, but gotcha. I did that for a few years. That was that's a good cred. I, yeah, I, uh, very good cred, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun, and that's uh, you know a good comedy cred. I that got me uh, work. I got to work on. Uh, Space goes coast to coast. Oh, when that's they, very cool. cool. Love that's that awesome. show. <laughs> when they did you write a it, did you write a whole episode of that or is well it... they had it was off the air and <laughs> then um, Game Tap the website optioned it and and they had the entire cast so like they just moved the show off of Adult Swim and said okay now we're gonna do it on Game Tap and I oh, got really to, yeah I got to write two episodes and to this day I can't find them anymore because they were only on Game Tap. And like, I guess they never got transferred to YouTube or whatever. It like, and they never me. went back to Cartoon Network after that. Like, you couldn't see them on a rerun. Yeah, I you guess not. Know? I guess they didn't end up there. I don't know who has them. They're probably on a DVD. Oh, somewhere. I'd love to see those. Yeah, yeah, they, I know, right? What was uh? Who, who was the guest on both of those episodes? Oh God, one was remember? the lead singer from Bare Naked Ladies. Okay. <laughs> and I forget the other one. Okay. It was just the just I the love two. that show. So, so much fun. It was fun too because what they do is they tape the interview and then they just give you all his sound bites. Yeah. And then you figure then out you, a show around you, it. You have to figure out the jokes. It was like around Mad Libs it. in a lot of ways. Mad Libs yeah. writing a script. <laughs> oh, that was great. That's and, awesome. Do you, now, uh, step back for the politically incorrect one. Do you remember any of the jokes that you wrote? Like one of the, maybe one of the better ones that wouldn't get a struck or anything like that? Oh, do you yeah. Remember? On politically incorrect. Um, the uh, writer of the Hokey Pokey died today and there uh, was some controversy at his funeral. You know, they started burying him and they put his left foot in, but then his left foot <laughs> fell out. That one got on. And then uh, uh, the, the UK can't find a sheriff of Nottingham uh, joke, which went something like... Uh, Oh gosh, now I've forgotten it. 
Now, there was a joke about the sheriff of Nottingham. That one got on. Okay. But sometimes, like, you would get a joke on, but, like, you know, it was the late night talk show thing where Bill would just butcher the joke, you know, but then make a joke oh, yeah. about butchering it. You'd be like, okay. oh, that was the setup. <laughs> no. Well, I still got paid. What a, what a thrill that must have been to see Bill, like, <laughs> saying your jokes, though. What, what, I yeah, know, right? No, that was fun. It was fun. That's really cool. Like, because, like, you know, because he's, like, a pretty prominent stand-up, too, on top of, you know, the political stuff, right? I mean, like, I, I've never seen him live, but I, would, I wouldn't I would mind going to one of his shows to see his stand-up act, you know? Oh, yeah, he does, you know, he, he goes to all the big venues, you know, when the show's off the air, and uh, he's done Atlantic City down my way, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you know, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's still a big name. I mean, he's still doing uh, basically the same show. It's just called Real Time with Bill Maher now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's just, he seems to like just move it to a different station and tweak the name and the format a bit. But yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? So, like, are, are you still doing stand up at all or do you kind of give that? Nah. Up? I, I, uh, I was never a great stand up. Like, okay. The best gig I got, I got to be the host of an open mic night at a gay club that was, uh, and my, my shtick was always, I was the token straight and uh, I was the host <laughs> and right. then I would introduce, and they were almost all gay comics. And then I would introduce them and they do, you know, their shtick. And then that would be the end of the night. Um, but, uh, and, and I, I would do a few open mic nights. I got big into the improv scene uh, okay. for a while in Philadelphia. I was in it for about 15 years. I was in a couple of different groups and we perform all over the place. And that to me was really helpful in terms of your create. I would recommend doing improv to any creator out there because it really loosens you up and allows you to come up with ideas and just throw them away, you know, and just keep coming up with ideas and throwing them away. And when you, when you do it that long, you eventually realize you're not so precious about your ideas. You know, you're willing yeah. to, keep keep crafting them and twisting them and doing different things with them so it, there's it a certain really modicum fun. sorry Joni, i didn't mean to interrupt you. you said there's a certain modicum of uh having to be able to kill your darlings to be able to yep. do that you know what i mean exactly exactly Plus it helps you i think um ground you a bit too and be able to you're open for critique and criticism and it helps mm -hmm. you you know deal with that i guess you know yeah like, and it uh, makes you absolutely fearless in public speaking and on stage i mean because I after agree. a while after a while you do enough improv like you've pretty much done everything on stage it's it's kind of funny how it happens i the only time i got embarrassed was in rehearsal one time one of the, one of my scene partners had to give me um i'll say this the clean way oral sex okay, uh, <laughs> okay. it was so uncomfortable because he was so good at miming it and it was like, I almost broke. I almost broke. I mean, like, I stayed in the scene, but it was, like, really uncomfortable. Really uncomfortable. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> That's awesome. So is the, is, uh, so the webcomic and uh, the Pineys is, or the webcomic factory and the Pineys is pretty much what you're doing now, basically, mm -hmm. right? More yeah, like that. A, and, an uh, author at this point, and then also doing just, like, the three-panel strips yep and uh also still doing uh super fat at superfat.com oh yeah yeah i want to i want to show that this is a great comic i i bought your uh when you uh when you put the one shot out a while ago i definitely i have that in my collection uh this is uh let me see it is super frat there drink it is. beer get laid oh cool <laughs> drink this beer is get a great laid comic. fight crime that's fight the crime. motto of super frat now you were doing this back in like probably like 2008 when i met you mm -hmm. uh how many yeah. how many strips do you have at this point of super frat uh i think we're about 20 strips away from 1500 That's wow crazy. <laughs> and it goes up once Holy a week smoke. right uh it's twice a week we're twice at uh, tuesdays week. and thursdays wow. and um um i basically after a certain point you know, the artist, he went on to bigger and better things as I have time for it. But I recycle the artwork and uh, just move the characters around and do different things with it. So, um, oh, OK. So you're still using the original artwork for this? Yeah. Because yeah. you have so many scripts. You probably have so many 
poses and like yeah you know, different... i just i just come up with new stuff i cut and paste i do a lot of cut over the years i've gotten really good at cutting and pasting other people's artwork <laughs> so you know like uh in this strip uh the the you see the uh beer can above uh that that character's name is rubber he's like a, right a okay. very dirty version of mr fantastic but okay. the uh, beer can above his head i added that so there's like a little extra thing like he's knocking over a beer can and they're talking to each other and then you see in the next strip it's like on the floor or something and that that is that's my one tiny contribution to the art that i can <laughs> that i could move a little beer can around um, i love it i, love I can't it. do much more than that like i you know i can't draw the characters so i have to like move their heads and expressions around and stuff like that um, awesome the center character i can't say his name without cursing um mr s i'll say he's okay. the guy who gets them he's the guy who grows all the weed and um uh, he's his mouth see like in the first two panels his mouth is open and then his mouth is closed and the one thing i could do is i could change whether or not his mouth is open whether or not he has a line in one of the panels and so like that's again my big contribution the cutting and the pasting of gotcha. expressions. <laughs> now um are you do you have like an end to the comic strip or are you just going to keep going forever like uh like peanuts or something like that uh the super frat's kind of like timeless in that you know it's been going on forever and the characters are sort of like static like the simpsons characters sort of are you yeah. know they're they're continually frat bros i mean they would have been out of college like i don't know 10 years ago if they were <laughs> were real and so it's it's you know it's it's the same concept it's like uh justice league meets animal house yeah and, I love you it. know it's the most <laughs> Very cool. irresponsible characters you could possibly think of having superpowers using them in the most irresponsible ways imaginable <laughs> and johnny you would you would admire tony's um marketing game because i remember uh when we saw you at c2e2 back in like i think like 2010 when you were promoting uh super frat um you had one of those um like fraternity paddles like the and people can get um, hit on the ass with them basically ah, but, then you, ah, <laughs> but then you also had didn't you also had anyone that bought the comic would get like a degree like from yeah we would uh, we would swear them would into take the pictures frat. and put it on social media and, mm -hmm. and have cool. them be part of the frat like i genius marketing by the way that is like, genius i love that and yeah, johnny everybody would got, love that johnny's a marketing guy he knows yeah <laughs> everybody got a nickname everybody got a certificate and uh, they would take the pledge and we would do basically the pledge from Animal House. I say your name and, you know, something like that. Fun. And, very fun. You know, it was just fun. Fun, yeah. fun to do, you know. Uh, that, I was just going to say, that's something when you go to a show, you go to a convention, and when you go home, like, you know, some stuff goes into a bag and you forget about it. But the fact that there was such interactivity there, that's awesome. You remember that. that you keep that with you. That's oh, really yeah. cool. And you know, yeah. my other memory of that show is when Samino took the paddle and hit Mike in the ass with it so hard, and it made such a whacking sound like the whole convention could hear it. And like, <laughs> I, I just that was so funny. That was so funny. <laughs> that's too funny. <laughs> really funny stuff. But yeah, that's what good I remember times. About. Good yeah, times. Big time, man. I used to love that. And then, um, yeah. So web, yeah. I think we covered up almost everything that you got going on. Is there anything else that? You got going on that we may not know about? Or anything or? coming up in the future? Uh, coming up in the future, I will be at the Flemington, New Jersey Summer Book Fest nice. this weekend, uh, May 29th, Sunday. Uh, so there's that. Then I'll be doing a signing on at the comic book store near Rowan University. Uh, and that's on June 4th. And then I'll be at Tom's River for the... Uh, june 12th uh show in the tom's rivers elks club and then to get to the rest of go to my site if you want to see all the various dates that i'm doing signings and i do signings awesome. i do events i do arts and crafts i do uh comic book shows i do book shows and uh you know the summer's big for me but also the fall is big because that's Halloween and that's Jersey yeah. Devil time. Yeah, perfect. Exactly. I was gonna say that your book is perfect for that time of year. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. October must be busy for you. Oh yeah, it's nuts. Yeah. 
It's nuts. Are, are you going to do anything? Are you going to be up at New York Comic Con at all or anything up that way or no? It's doing New York. Doing. I used to do those shows, but the problem would always be the shows a lot are of too, money. It's too big. It's like yeah. too big for me. I would have to bring a team of four to really make enough money, and I would have to have enough inventory to make it work. I once yeah. crunched the numbers in a video and I realized like it's, it's crazy. Just, it's just too big. Yeah. I would rather go to a smaller show or a medium show and do it by myself, not have to put out a lot of money, not have to get a hotel room or anything like that. I can make more money and I'll it's be home true. the same night. Yep. And it's just better. Um, one day York, shows is where it's love at, the yeah. going home the same night business too. Believe me. Like, one day comic cons day shows and i, I love the feet. shows that they do at libraries now too like they do they start libraries are starting to do like mini comic cons yep. and those those are great and very very little table cost if any yeah yep. i'll do the horror cons now because i have the pineys like i did yeah. the new jersey horror con at the showboat casino i did that last october and then i did it in like april and it was a good show but it's like it's a three day show, a lot of driving, and it's like a lot of expense. Yeah. But I mean, I still made money, but I'd rather do a show that I could get in for free or next to free, do it all one day, and then I'm done. Yeah, definitely. I, and, I, and that's what I did uh, over the weekend. I did the Philly show on Sunday, and I did a signing at Level Up Entertainment in the Hamilton Mall in Mays Landing. And I did. I did good at both of them. So how, who could complain? Yeah, those are great. And then the other thing you think about too with three-day shows is your time. I mean, like how much time is wasted for just if you break even, you know what I mean? Like yeah, You think about I, like all that time you could be making videos for your channel. You could be writing the next novel, you know? It's like, that's what I think about now when I do shows and if it's – more than one day, I gotta really think about if it's worth it or something. The value in time that's the, the one thing I've learned as huge, well, you know, so. is that you can't get that time back. And no, you know, I've sat not. too many times in a, in a in an empty uh empty hotel ballroom, you know, waiting for customers to come in, and, and like, you're just thinking how much shit you have back. to do at home, you know, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, how many deadlines you have, you know, yeah, it can be brutal, and it's like. You know, it has to be cost effective. And that's another reason why I stick with regional now. You know, I used to go out to Ohio and Indianapolis and true. LA. Yeah. I went to LA and Chicago and all these different places. And they were fun to do, but could I make money. the money? Yeah. No, I yeah. couldn't make the money on comics. No. I could probably make it on books because the price point's a little higher, but I'd have to sell a lot of books. I'd have to carry a lot of material to the table. And I'm really getting sick of carrying stuff, too. My dream is to be famous enough to walk into a con carrying it's nothing. all there. That's it's all good. There. Yeah, the yeah. Less, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The less you have <laughs> but, to bring to a show, the more you know clout you have, essentially, right? Exactly. That's why when we have to all do shows in Germany. We yeah. were all these superstars. <laughs> yeah. When, when the vendors tell me, don't bring anything, we'll have nothing to sell, we have to sell yeah. it. I'll be like, okay, great, yeah. awesome. Bring a Sharpie, that's it. Right. Yep. <laughs> no, you give me a Sharpie. I'm yeah. famous now. Yeah. It's on the right. I'm very right? famous. Yeah. Bring me Sharpies and sandwiches and iced teas. And Evian. Evian yeah. water. Heavy Evian. water. Where's that kid with my latte? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's great. That's, Amazing. that's, you know, and some cons are like that. I've done cons like that. Oh, yeah. You know, they take care of you. Dragon yeah. Con, number yeah. one, baby. Oh, I heard number a lot of good stuff about Dragon Con. Number one. Those guys are kings. Nice. They are absolute kings. They have their own green room. No, no uh, fans. Sorry, fans. But, you know, <laughs> after the con, we, we need to get away from you for a little while. Go relax. Yeah. All free food and awesome. booze and uh, volunteers feeding you. What could be better? Nice. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> That's great. And they're so nice. They're so Thanks. nice at Dragon Con. And I've been to a few cons someday. like that. Nice. And, you know, uh, gaming cons, they tend to have more money. They tend to treat you really well in terms of the hotel and things like that. Horror cons, I think they're getting there. I think horror cons may be the next big con, you know, yeah. because the um, the fan base there 
is kind of untapped. You know, there's a lot of fans of horror. And, and horror uh, fans are rabid too. They love collecting, yeah. and it's it's in the <laughs> wheelhouse for that. They're and very loyal. We should all all we should all be as famous as Hasselhoff in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> nice. But yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, I'm I'm gonna start wrapping up. We've been going for 90 minutes. It doesn't oh, seem man. that long. No, I'm time flies when we're having forever. fun, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so as we start to wrap up, Tony, where can people find you? Like uh Give us, give us some, some plugs. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, check out the Web Comic Factory at thewebcomicfactory.com for all the comics. Seven days a week, a new comic every day, and a That's huge awesome. library going back to 2010. That's crazy. Um, super Ooh, frat at superfrat.com. Going back uh, almost 1,500 strips. Uh, so crazy. read that. And then, of course, the Pineys at thepineys.com, all available at Amazon. Uh, we've got books, ebooks, Kindle Unlimited is free. I've got an audio book for the first book, and I've got other books too. I've got um, Wokistan, a novel, which I co wrote with Christian. Holly Woke, another novel. They're both political satire. I've got F You, I'm Italian, Why We Italians Are Awesome, my funny book, <laughs> Italian Heritage. Love it. So that's from Ulysses Press. Okay. Um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, I've got my game, Complete Mafia for D20, for those of you who role play. Oh, wow. So uh, cool. you can check all that. That's all listed at Amazon. I've got my graphic novel, Lester Crenshaw is Dead, about a comic geek who gets turned into a vampire, but he's terrible at it. So his stepmom and his sister have to help him be a vampire. And uh, <laughs> cool. so, uh, yeah. And so all my stuff is all online. Come to my site. Uh, go to my YouTube, go, go to all my various links and thanks for having me on the show, guys. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Same Tony. Great, it was great catching up with you. And uh, also I put some of the links in the description there for Tony's uh, website. And I don't know if I have all of them, but if you follow, I think it at least goes to web comic factory so you can pick up everything. That's, there. Yeah. That's the main one. That's or just, one. you know, rewind this video and get all the links directly <laughs> from tony how about you johnny you got anything that you want to uh, uh just want to do a quick uh rundown of shout outs on kickstarter of projects that are live right now that you still have a chance to back okay. uh seven days to go you got the gallows man issues okay. one and two from dismay comics uh there's gun engine zero uh, that's got 23 hours to go. So in the final hours, oh, geez. For, uh, how close is he? I, I looked, uh, it was, it was not painful. very, unfortunately, uh, but, uh, yeah. you know, you never know those miracle moments usually come in at the zero hours. Yeah, sometimes. That's true. So take a look at that. Like I mentioned at the top of the show, we have Faye by Jay Moore's. He's, uh, all he's a little over halfway. That's so he's great. doing really so good. He launched for, a day or so ago, right? Yeah. And he's got 43 days to go. So there's some time, right? So check that out. A good friend of mine, Frankie White, I know from Twitter, uh, part of the comics community there. Uh, he's got the Amber Door, number one. That's live on Kickstarter. That's it. So you can back that. It's got 12 days left to go. It's a short window, but it's a guaranteed book because it's it. It's already done. So check that out. Uh, our good friend, Phil Myra, who's been in the show before. I believe he's coming up for a guest spot soon. Uh, we got Purple Eyes, volume one. That's uh actually got 20 days left to go. That's about a little under at a halfway point, but I think that one's going to make it. And uh, last but not least, don't forget, with uh, six days left to go, Adventures of Wonder Duck, our good friend uh, oh, yeah. George Medina, he's got that book we'll out. And then back. last but not least, I just want to th Tony, it was great to get to know you, your work, you as a creator. It was wonderful having you on. I hope we can have you on in the future. And uh, I just I tell you, uh, you know, please take a moment to check out uh, Tony's work. Uh, you know, on his line is web comics and, uh, you know, maybe even browse his IMDB when you're looking for something to watch. There you go. I'm going to Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> roommates. We'll, we'll, we'll push roommates. Yeah, and there here, you go. And there here you will go. be episode 16, which was a brilliant episode that you wrote. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there was actually another episode I wrote that goes up that's unproduced. Oh, uh, that's right. Oh. That's right. What was the premise on that one? Do you remember? 
uh, I wrote myself into it that I wanted to That's be... That's right. It was like uh, you played like a Stan Lee type, right? At a yeah, convention. but I was like a drunken mess. Like I was yes. a comic book superstar. <laughs> and it was sort of like the whole thing, never meet your heroes. Like I'm yeah. kind of a drunken idiot. And you guys are like, you're like my biggest fans, but I'm like a total a-hole. Yeah. <laughs> that was going to be great. Yeah, we. I, I remember that now. Um, the one you wrote, though, Johnny, you would love this premise. So the episode... Yeah, what was it? So it was called Never Meet Your Heroes Penciler. And it was basically the Hero Envy guys find out that, you know, this this penciler that drew one issue of Green Lantern actually like lived close to them. So they're like, oh, let's, you know, let's go out there. You know, we're not stalkers. You know, They'll, this guy will love it if we visit him. So we basically go find this, uh, this um, penciler and he's basically getting evicted. So like, Wally was like, "Oh, come, come live with us." And the guy ends up being the biggest mooch and the biggest, <laughs> uh, like, the biggest storyteller. It, it was a really funny episode. It was just great. I love that. That's yeah. great. <laughs> so yeah, that was uh, that was. I often go back whenever I rewatch some of those. I always kind of watch that one. I think that one was really brilliant. So really funny stuff. Um, but yeah, let me uh, reiterate the same that Johnny, thank you for coming on. Thanks. Great catching up with you again. It's been a long time. Yeah, you time. too, buddy. You know, it's too been, long. Uh, too long. Very long. Very long. Um, and uh, yeah, and also I would say check out uh, the pre-launch for Mighty Mascots 7, 8, and 9. It's up on Indiegogo now. Sign up if you can. And then also uh, July 16th for Plastic City Comic Con. Definitely come see us there. Come on um, down. Yeah, definitely. Johnny will be there. I'll be there. Uh, we got Paul Pelletier coming. We got Joe St. Pierre. We got a few other people. Um, uh, uh, I'm blanking on names, but we got we got a bunch of creators coming, so it's going to be a great show. Um, all right. Any last words before we close out this episode of Indie Comics Relay? Uh, no? Thanks, guys. Yeah. Be excellent for one another. All right. Awesome. All right, guys, we'll be back next week with a bonus episode with uh, George Medina and Sam Vera. And we're actually going to be on a Tuesday next week, one of our rare Tuesday episodes. So check us out. I'll put all the links up for that next week. And um, have a great Memorial Day, everybody. Have a good one. Uh, all right. Bye. Read some comics. See you guys later. Bye. <laughs>